We export and import story. A any questions before that? that there is an unemployment in China still. Unemployment, right. Uh, well, there is... Because still we believe that there is a huge amount of employees there. Uh, is it because there, there lack specialists in workforce or because of this fluctuation, that you said, between urban areas and the cities? That's one reason is exactly the, that the people who are needed might not match the the skills that are required, uh, the, the, the skills that are available, uh, which is actually the what the this year's Nobel Prize in Economics was awarded for. It was about research in on friction in labor markets. Basically, you, if you have jobs that remain uh, vacant and you have people who are looking for jobs at the same time, because they takes time and information to find the match. Uh, but also in China's case, this restructuring from the coast, the, the movement of industries from the coast inland is taking time. If you're a factory owner in the southern Guangzhou province, and you think you should be paying your workers $100 a month, and you don't find people who are willing to work for $100 because they can find a job for $120 in Shanghai, let's say, you would still, it will take you some time to either realize that you have to raise your price or move your factory further inland. So basically, it, it, there is a lag. And there are there is an employment. The unemployment rate in urban China is about four or five percent. Uh, it's also the, another problem is that the, a lot of these unemployed are actually former employees of state-owned companies who don't have the skills to do much in in the present economy. And there, a lot of them are are concentrated in the northeast, which is the rust belt of China. Just like the U.S. has the Ohio and Pennsylvania Rust Belt, uh, the northeast of China, bordering Korea and Russia, used to be the most developed heavy industry region. And it was uh, under Japanese um, domination for four decades before the Second World War. So all the heavy industry was there, steel and coal. And now it's just uh, ghost towns. Back to the export story. Uh, you may have heard that last year China overtook Germany as the biggest exporter in the world, but that's only about goods exports. If you include services, the US still remains the biggest exporter, and then Germany comes second, so China is third. Of course, at some point it will overtake them, but not yet. And a lot of people think that these exports are the result of the state-owned state companies exporting, but actually the, the, the role of the state has shrunk to a fifth end of the economy. So the rest of it is private Chinese or uh, rural collectives, which are still private, basically, or foreign-owned foreign companies. And in this, China resembles a lot France, because France does, uses some central, has, first it has a, a lot of big state-owned companies, just like China does, but it also has a vibrant private sector. And of course it's very socialist-minded, which might be even more, France now is probably more socialist than China is. That's the role of foreign invest, foreign companies in China. Over 50% of the exports are created by companies which have foreign owners. And the, the other 30% are private, 30-40% private companies. And the state-owned companies have a very small share of 
exports, but they still account for a larger share of the domestic market. And now there have been some uh, interesting debates between how, on how, how much you can trust Chinese statistics, because it turns out that China's um, customs figures and the, the numbers from the US don't match, or the numbers from Europe don't match. It turns out that China has, you see the trade surplus, the, the blue line, uh, on the right, that's according to the United States, that's the trade surplus of China according to US data, and the darker line underneath is the trade surplus of China according to Chinese data. And it looks like China is cooking its books, but it's not the, the it's, there is a grain of truth in it. China does not want to come, come across to the whole world as the, this huge exporter, which it's, it is to some extent, we'll get deal. We'll deal with that a bit later. But um, there are three reasons why there is this difference between in the data. First, there is um, Chinese exports. A lot of them go by Hong Kong. So uh, when, when you're exporting something, it's hard to to know where it will end up. Well, when you're importing it, you know where it came from. So it's easier for the Americans to to figure out that what's Chinese exports, and it's harder for the Chinese to say, hey, this is going not to Hong Kong only, but to, to the US. So if you, if you add the Hong Kong re-export uh, data, it's in the, the line, the dotted line in the middle, it uh, somewhat reduces the discrepancy. Then comes the difference between the exports and imports. China calculates the exports at uh, uh, at the, is the free on board price, while when you import something, you usually add the, the cost of insurance and freight into the uh, price, so that accounts for another 5 to 7 percent of the difference. And then, last, something interesting which is related to the closed capital account and to the uh, fixed exchange rate in China. Foreign investors know that the Chinese currency will rise in value and they want to get more money into China to change money into Chinese Yuan so that when it rises they can sell back and make a profit. But they can't do it right now freely because they need the permission of the government for every single transaction. So what they do is they export something at an over overpriced rate let's say this should have been $10, but if I export it from China for 100 I bring in $100, which I can invest, I can convert into Chinese Yuan and keep it in China until the currency appreciates. So basically, uh, it's uh, a, a, a way of, through these fictitious exports, which are increasing the, the trade surplus data for China, the, the, the reason part of it is that this is capital, hot money, in search of profit. And now about the role of exports in GDP. That's Chinese data. Uh, and uh, at the very top, you see the 7.9% share of Chinese exports as in the, in the economy of China. So only 8%, according to the Chinese, I've seen data up to 12%, which might be even more realistic, but any, any, you see that exports are not the, the underlying engine of Chinese economic growth. It is mostly investment, which is the 43%, and consumption, which is uh, private consumption, 35%. And that's the, in the US, it's the other way around. Yes, but where the money for private consumption comes from, for exports? Well, no, it, it doesn't have to go via... The money doesn't have to leave the, the country. It can be created inside the growth. For instance, if you work for a company and it, 
it just sells on the domestic market, you get your salary, you spend it, you buy things that are produced locally, other people true, spend true, it. That, that's true for private consumption, but you have to have influx of fresh money into the country for the people to, to spend more. Otherwise... Well, actually, that's, I think I know what you mean. That's that's one of the. I don't believe in the self-sustained model for countries. You have to have the inflow of money. Sure, but one, one on the inflow for one country is an outflow for another, yes, sure. right? So I, I think the, the the U.S. has been pushing China to revalue the exchange rate so that Chinese households can buy more and will buy more because it will be cheaper to buy imported stuff. And then they will feel richer, and the trade surplus of China will be smaller. So they, they will be, it will be a win-win for both sides. Uh, and China is moving in, in that direction. It's just, uh, uh, I think it's more of a psychological um, thing. China doesn't like to be told what it should do. So if, if things are a little bit more backstage and uh, not so public, is as it is now happening. Like in, in the US Congress, all the debates are mostly for domestic consumption, for, for the domestic political scene in the states. Uh, if, if there isn't so much pressure, China will be doing these things anyway. Uh, and actually, in the US, private consumption accounts for about yeah, two thirds, 67% of, of GDP, while in China you see it's half that rate. So China can increase its private consumption. The reason why it's not happening is that people don't have the social safety nets and healthcare. And once you, well, there are some now, a health plan is being rolled out. There are experiments with uh, pension systems in, in separate provinces. Once people feel secure that they won't be left out in the cold, they, they will be willing to spend more. This is a calculation by McKinsey in which they actually traced, the, they calculated the, role, the, the share of exports <coughs> in GDP growth, the 3.3% 3, 3 here, which is part of the 12% growth on average for five years, up to 2007, uh, they only calculated the imports that go into an, a given export. They didn't take all exports minus all imports and say that's the role of the exports. They, they tried to break it down so that if you're exporting a car from China, you subtract the, the imports of uh, car parts. And then they that's a more precise way of calculating it. And of course, again, it, it shows only one quarter of the growth in GDP is the result of, of exports. Basically, it's not the whole economy that they talk about here, it's just the increment. And of course, exports are more uh, the more dynamic part of the economy, so they're, they're about a quarter of, accounts for a quarter of that growth. And the, the flip side of the story is that China is a huge importer uh, for instance, China has traditionally a trade deficit with Japan because it imports machines and they are expensive while it exports to Japan mushrooms and uh, I don't know, furniture. And if you exclude the US, uh, the, the, the remaining G20 countries are in uh,